This November, we begin a new year of Nintendo Power magazine, well, a new year of Nintendo Power, with Nintendo Power issue number 45 for January of 1993, and as much as we've been looking back on the NES's past, this issue Nintendo Power looks back on the NES as well. How, you ask? Keep watching to find out. Our cover game this issue is The Addams Family, Pugsley's Scavenger Hunt for the Super Nintendo. Once again, they have a drawn cover, this time using art from the animated series. In the letters column, we have some questions about whether we'll get Final Fantasy III. The response predicts that Final Fantasy V will be released as three, which is ultimately incorrect. VI is released as three. We also get a contact mailing address for um, Squaresoft. In the indestructible Nintendo hardware file, we have a letter from a reader whose Super Nintendo survived Hurricane Andrew. We start off the Super Nintendo coverage with the first mecha action game for the SNES, Cybernator. I am pleased to see that the character designs of this game have not been de in an attempt to make it more American, much as we had with Power Blade, for example, on the NES. We have a map of Stage 1 and notes on Stages 2 through 5. Cybernator is a... It is a disjointed action game. The first stage is a stage that needs to be played with care, deliberation, and caution, as while your robot can take a fair amount of damage before it gets knocked out, if you try to contra your way through this level, you'll get taken down hard, in terms of running and gunning, never stop going, that sort of thing. This is why, with the gameplay of Capture for this video, is using a lot of saves coming, because I'm trying to beat the level in a reasonable amount of time for the video, instead of taking my time. Then there's the second level, which starts with a shoot-em-up sequence that the game is really not designed to handle, before we're going into a zero-gravity sequence that returns to the previously more deliberate gameplay, except for the fact that you've now taken some very heavy damage by going through the asteroid belt, so you have less room to make mistakes and learn how the game has changed in this new gameplay style, zero-gravity. It's unfortunate, particularly since the first level is very well put together, and it teaches you the basic mechanics and the way you need to keep, play the game fairly well. I do need to give some props to the story for presenting within the limitations of 68-bit gameplay and the Super Nintendo, and for that matter, Nintendo of America's content policies, a story with a strong sense of shades of gray. It's not as dark gray and cynical as something like Armored Trooper Votoms, Instead, goes for something with the sense that there are no real good guys or bad guys, just our guys and their guys. It's closer to the narrative of, say, Mobile Suit Gundam, which is doubly interesting since the opening mission is the reverse of the opening of Mobile Suit Gundam, where you're attacking a space colony that's of a O'Neill cylinder design and taking out a prototype warship. Next is Harley's Humongous Adventure, which appears to be an action platformer done with a Honey, I Shrunk the Kids visual style. The article has maps of the first four levels and notes on level five. This gameplay is kind of rough, having the level of overly floaty feeling platforming that I've come to expect from a platformer from the kind of developer who was based out of the UK and cut their teeth on the Amiga or the ZX Spectrum as opposed to having been developed first for consoles. Except this game was developed for the SNES first and from, was from the US. Who went on and by a developer called Visual Concepts, who went on to develop sport games for 2K. On the other hand, well, they'd go on to develop Lester the Unlikely, so there's that. Otherwise, there doesn't seem to be any sort of narrative continuity of levels, and otherwise, it's your standard platformer gameplay with the shrunken aesthetic. Next up is Wing Commander. This is the first space sim that's been covered in Nintendo Power, and the start of Origin's other 
very beloved franchise alongside the Ultima series. The article has notes on the interface and dogfighting tactics. Wing Commander is a game which you really need the manual for. It took me a while to figure out the controls, and even then, I really don't have the nitty-gritty details of fighter dogfighting down. Part of the problem is this is a system that game that has more systems than the Super Nintendo controller has buttons for, meaning that for some routine, routine things that you'll need to do in combat, you'll have to press repeated combinations of buttons, like giving orders to your wingman, or even contacting your carrier for permission to land. On a computer keyboard, you have a bunch of keyboard shortcuts you can use, and with a reference card sitting in front of you, you'll be fine. Heck, even if you're using a DOS box and an Xbox 360 or Xbox One controller in lieu of a fight stick, you still got the keyboard. On the other hand, for Nintendo, like, there are combinations of select and X, or left bumper and X, to access various menus, and you have to time them right, and X also selects the option on the menu, and all these other issues. So frankly, while Wing Commander is a great game series, and I absolutely recommend playing this game, playing these games, the Super Nintendo is simply not the optimal way to play it. Next up is Jeopardy for the Super Nintendo, which is an adaptation of the game show, and I'm going to skip this because you generally know what you're getting into when you play a Jeopardy game. And now we come to our cover game, The Addams Family, Pugsley Scavenger Hunt. It's developed by Ocean, and it's a nonlinear platformer, which thus far has been a combination that has never failed to fail, especially when the Addams Family license is involved. Man, I'm really starting to miss Sunsoft and Fester's Quest. I'll say this for Ocean. The controls for their platformers have improved. The jumps, while still floaty, feel less floaty than some of their earlier games did. That said, movement still feels like you're sliding on ice, and there are other negative design elements that made their way into the game. In particular, it feels like the designers decided to make some decisions to emulate some early games from the NES generation, with blind switches that you can't undo, that open or close portions of the level, and completely invisible items that you can collect for points or other necessities. It's rather frustrating, and it really doesn't do much to help resolve a bunch of existing issues the game already faces. Nintendo Power has covered some Koei strategy games in the past, particularly Nobunaga's Ambition. Also on this show, we've covered Bandit Kings of Ancient China in a Best of the Rest episode. Now, in this episode, we have Aerobiz, a business strategy game. The article gives some general strategies for growing your business. Aerobiz is, in a way, a slower burn than Nobunaga's Ambition or the other Tecmo's military strategy games. Part of the problem is any feedback that you get in terms of your decisions is very delayed, not only in terms of the interface, but in terms of the process for negotiating for additional slots at their airports, or buying and setting up hotels at particular locations, and so on. It's a little easier to accidentally make some bad decisions that can screw yourself over in terms of overreach in your business planning. It feels, in terms of raw depth, like the Super Nintendo equivalent of something like Europa Universalis. Not in the sense that the depth is identical, mind you. I mean in the sense that the games push for as much depth as their platform, and the controls for that platform can handle and still be playable. But as a consequence, if you're coming in cold, you may need to have some assistance in terms of reading or watching a Let's Play to give you something of a de facto tutorial. The next article, titled... Unsung Heroes of the NES is very interesting and very different from what we've had thus far in Nintendo Power. This is basically a post-mortem for several titles on the NES, evaluating why these titles failed to become hits, with almost all these titles being ones that were featured in Nintendo Power. The article cites, in particular, poor distribution, as in the case of Metal Storm and Vice Project Doom, and in other cases, the delay between the actual release date being later than when the game was featured in Nintendo Power, and consequently, by the time the game came out, the buzz that would have gotten a boost in sales from Nintendo Power had released, had eased. This is particularly notable in those cases because NES games are manufactured by Nintendo and distributed by Nintendo, and as Nintendo Power is a house organ, the mention of these games can be taken as a tacit admission of guilt by Nintendo that these games were good, but Nintendo's policies at the time made it more difficult for those games to succeed. 
They don't entirely shoulder all the blame themselves, though. River City Ransom's failure to become the smash that it deserved to be is laid on the rather complicated licensing for Technos Japan's games in the U.S., with Trade West releasing Double Dragon, while River City Ransom was released by Technos themselves. The way the article presents it, because Technos had a third party release Double Dragons or licensed it to a third party, they unintentionally undermined their own brand by denying themselves a big hit that they could have leveraged when they went to publish their other major brawler later. It makes sense, the same way that people came to associate quality RPGs with Square, or sport quality sports games with Electronic Arts. Some of the criticisms they bring up are rather... dumb. They attribute the failure of Kickle Cubicle, Solar Jetman, Star Tropics, Rockin', Cat, Rockin Cats, Blaster Master, Shadowgate, Snake Rattle and Roll, and Maniac Mansion to a lack of brand recognition and memorable characters. In some cases, saying that if they reskinned the game with licensed characters, the game might have succeeded. That is incredibly dumb because if you don't own characters you license from somebody else, which is kind of the whole idea behind licensing something, then. I'll just redo that line. <clears throat> Some of the criticisms they bring up are rather dumb. The writers of this article attribute the failure of Keiko Cubicle, Solar Jetman, Star Tropics, Rockin' Cats, Blaster Master, Shadowgate, Snake Rattle and Roll, and Maniac Mansion to a lack of brand recognition and memorable characters. In some cases, outright saying that if the developers had reskinned the game with licensed characters, then the game might have succeeded. This is very dumb because, frankly, you don't own characters you license from someone else. That's the whole idea behind licensing the characters. By creating your own characters, you create a brand that you own, characters you own, with, and thus, consequently, you have complete control over the destiny of that line and whatever form it takes. And you can make as many games about it for as long as they sell, and your company is able to pay its employees. And you can make them in whatever genre you want. RPGs, platformers, sports games, whatever. That's the whole thing that with what um, Technos did, did with the downtown Niketsu series of games, aka the River City Ransom series, Crash and the Boys, what have you. You will never have a license holder who will tell you no, and you never have to worry about losing the rights, and thus consequently losing the ability to make future games with those characters, along with your ability to reprint past games. And this is exceptionally absurd because when they're, we're talking about, well, when we're saying, oh, these games don't have memorable characters, one of the games they list is Maniac Mansion, which got an animated television series. Not just a sequel in the form of Day of the Tentacle, but a cartoon show on network television. To put this another way, in some form or another, Final Fight and Streets of Rage have always been in print. Sonic the Hedgehog and Super Mario Brothers have always been in print. DuckTales and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles brawlers from Konami, which are classics of the platformer and brawler genre. Hell, DuckTales is a game that, influ that has had influences, influenced titles that have been seen to this day, like Shovel Knight. Those are games that have gone in and out of print and not always been available, because Capcom loses, lost the license to Disney at a point. So getting a license to another company's intellectual property and other company's characters is not a be-all, end-all. Quite the opposite. In the classified information column, we have a new engine class in Super Mario Kart that you can access and an item duplication trick for Final Fantasy II. There's a new comic this issue in the form of Star Fox. The comic is done by Benimaru Ito, an artist and illustrator who works for Nintendo and has in the past done art in Nintendo Power magazine. This issue sets up Star Fox as a bunch of Robin Hood-esque anti-heroes who appears will be stealing their R-Wings from Andros. Moving on to Game Boy titles, we start off with the Game Boy port of Darkwing Duck for the NES. The article includes information on power-ups and notes on each level of the game. By this point in the lifespan of the Game Boy, I think it's safe to say that Capcom has figured out the fine art of pointing, porting NES games to the Game Boy and managing the controls, gameplay, and figured out the right relationship between the size of the sprites and the size of the screen. The controls work fairly well, but I have some issues with the level design. The checkpointing in the game is not great, with no mid-level checkpointing, and there's also no real feedback on 
how much health the boss does or does not have left, which makes it tricky to know how long I need to keep shooting them. Our second Game Boy title is Spot, the Cool Adventure, the first 7-Up mascot platformer, but not the first 7-Up game we've covered thus far. That would be Spot for the Game Boy and the NES, which was something of an adaptation of Othello and Reversi. Spot, the Cool Adventure, runs into some level design issues. In particular, the game runs into issues with jumps where the game's physics don't quite work, and the game does a poor job of tutorializing what exactly you need to do to accomplish those jumps. I'm not saying those jumps are impossible to accomplish, but I am saying that what is needed for those jumps is not necessarily intuitive. I, I eventually pulled off one of the particularly difficult jumps in particular, but I have no idea how I did it, which is the problem. If in a game you have no idea how you accomplish something that you need to do in order to progress, then that's its mark of poor design. Continuing with the licensed games, we have Alien 3, the first video game adaptation of David Fincher's installment of the Alien franchise that we've come to thus far. As opposed to the console versions of the game, which have a side-scrolling perspective, this game has a top-down view. While Alien 3 on the Super Nintendo, which I have played on my own prior to this, plays more like Metroid, the Game Boy version feels more like a survival horror game and plays a lot like the NES and Game Boy Jurassic Park game, which, admittedly as of this issue, Nintendo Power hasn't come out yet. The game has you roaming the Fury Prison Colony as Ellen Ripley, trying to accomplish various objectives, which also leads to where the game falls apart. The problem is that the game doesn't really have much in terms of landmarks, and the game doesn't give you a map to help you navigate the levels. Furthermore, which is particularly an issue because this is a mobile game or portable game, I couldn't find any options for saving your game or getting a password, which is a must if you need to stop playing due to a low battery charge because you've reached your destination, or because you're playing in a waiting room and it's time for your appointment or to leave. Additionally, your character is much more squishy in the Game Boy version than they are in the Super Nintendo version, in cart because Ripley in the Super Nintendo version is better able to pr protect herself as she has a gun from the very beginning. In the Game Boy, you have a cattle prod, which is effectively useless, and further, the strength of the aliens in the field will increase over time in a very linear time-based situation. So if you take too long exploring, the opponents you face will be more powerful than your weapons, and then you, you will die. Consequently, the real optimal way to play the game is to explore until you find the next area you need to reach, at which point you'll have died, or the, or the enemies will have reached a point that you cannot proceed and you will die horribly, and then you turn the game off, start over from the very beginning, and then go where you need to go straight off, which is not really a productive or good way to play. So, I can't recommend this version of the game, but I may like the Super Nintendo or the NES version more when those come up. Next is a Ren and Stimpy licensed game subtitled Space Cadet Adventures. The guide doesn't give much more information than that. I shouldn't be surprised that this game is terrible. It's a licensed game based on an early 90s cartoon show that was more known for its edgy sense of humor than any particular narrative that lent itself to gameplay. So the game controls really poorly, with sprites that are too large for the obstacles and platforming involved, with sluggish movement, and no continues. This is the perfect example of a shovelware platformer. Skip it. Next, we have another NES port with Rampart. Rampart has this same problems, whether for the Game Boy or NES, that come with this game with Rampart as played as a single-player game. When it comes time to place wall pieces to build the wall in your castle, you can't rotate your pieces, and you can't tell what pieces are coming up next. The game has some additional issues related to targeting and collision detection on enemies. Specifically, the sprites for enemies are larger than their hitboxes, and I can't really tell well where their hitboxes are. I kind of fault this less on an arcade cabinet as well, it'd still be crappy. It'd be crappy I'd expect from a game that is actively trying to eat your quarters. But when you're porting a game for the home, you're not trying to eat people's quarters anymore, you're trying to create a fun, enjoyable experience. And thus, for arcade ports, you need to make the gameplay a little more forgiving. So, once again, skip this game. We're continuing with the NES to Game Boy ports with The Little Mermaid. This feels a lot harder than the NES version did. It's not due to getting the scale of the sprites wrong. Capcom got that part perfect. 
it's not due to changes in the mechanics. That's pretty much the same. Instead, it's an issue with the checkpointing and how far it sets you back mechanically when you die. Basically, deaths in the game are indistinguishable from continues. Both reset you back to the start of the level, and both reset your power level to the base level. Your number of points doesn't change between death and a continuum, because you gain points at the end of a level. On the one hand, it's nice to see a game be slightly forward-thinking by eliminating the whole lives continues dichotomy entirely. On the other hand, I do appreciate the concept of, well, lives and continues, and if you're eliminating the dichotomy, it works if you have mid-level checkpoints. And this game doesn't. So, if you're having lives and continues separately, then you need to have mid-level checkpoints. And this doesn't do that. In Gouncer's Corner, we have a bunch of tips for RPGs, including Dragon Warrior 4, Might and Magic, Soul Blazer, and Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. Moving into our uh, NES titles, we start off with Zen, Intergalactic Ninja. This is a action platformer with a anti-pollution pro-environment theme. The character comes from an indie comic series, much as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles did, though the anti-pollution and pro-environment concept is original to the game. The article has a rundown of power-ups and attacks, and going from the maps, these levels appear to also have a mix of isometric and traditional 2D levels. Man, I'm not sure how this game works. It feels like a bunch of disparate gameplay ideas mashed together into a single game, and they don't quite work well together. We have an isometric platformer, which is never a concept that works well, in one level. In another level, you're juggling fighting a boss with protecting items in the environment of the level, a concept that works if you're fighting trash enemies and protecting objects, but not if you're fighting the boss, fighting trash enemies, and protecting the objects. This could have been good if a bit more time had been spent on it and they put together a good combined structure. However, it feels like Konami had a whole bunch of level ideas that they wanted to use and didn't have a game that they could put them together with, so they just picked this one and rather than trying to thematically tie them, just shove them all in there and call it a day. And that's not really what you need to make a good game. Next is Bomberman 2. The first Bomberman game did get any coverage, nor did it appear in the top 20, so this game gets full coverage of the game mechanics and discussion thereof. It bears mentioning that this game has three, but not four, player multiplayer. Bomberman 2's gameplay is really simple, but frankly, it doesn't need to be any more complex than it is. The difficulty of levels increases not through difficulty in the level design, but by introducing more types of enemies with different movement patterns that the player needs to learn. Consequently, getting good at the game is based on learning. Learning enemies' movement patterns, learning the enemies, what they look like, and figuring out how to defeat those enemies with the attack options you have available. That said... Bomberman as a series really doesn't come into its own until you get four-player multiplayer, at which point it becomes the best of all part possible party games. Speaking from personal experience, as the later Bomberman games, that's something I killed a lot of time on in middle school and high school. Next is the new Tiny Toon Adventures game. The game has a semi-nonlinear structure where you have to earn enough tickets on the other five levels to get into the fun house. The problem with Tiny Toon Adventures 2 is that this is a game which relies very heavily on memorization of the four levels before the pun house, not five as I thought from reading the article. Three of them are four scrolling levels, which means that you have to focus on memorizing the levels in order to get the scores you need to progress in the game. This is why you're seeing so much saves coming in this gameplay footage. Further, co just completing each level once is not enough to get you enough points to get into the fun house. You have to grind. I can forgive grind in an RPG. It's almost intrinsic to the genre. In a platformer, though, it's practically antithetical to the genre, unless you're putting out a hybrid game like with Castlevania 2, which this game isn't. It's unfortunate because the general theme of the game, basing the levels of the game around an amusement park, is a generally solid concept. And some of the four scrolling levels work fairly well, and if they had some non four scrolling levels, to balance it out, that'd be great. It's just the particulars of the execution which are where things fall apart. Finally, we have Time Diver Eon Man, a game which was completed but never released. 
The game has a Terminator-inspired plot, with the person in the past being faced by enemies from the future and having to become a hero, or a superhero in this case, because of it. The article has maps of the first three stages. Fortunately, somebody dumped the ROM from a prototype cartridge, so I can, in fact, play this game for review. Now, I don't know if the game that is on the ROM that I played is the same version that was used for the guide in Nintendo Power Magazine, so take that as a disclaimer. Considering I'm playing a prototype, I'm not surprised that this game needs some polish. Some enemies don't use their attack animations, and the first boss fight can stand to be tweaked a little, but there's a game here with some interesting promise. I kind of wish that the game had been finished and gotten an official release, because what we have here is interesting and fun to play, just needs a little work. In the top 20, Street Fighter 2 remains on top of the charts for the Super Nintendo, with Tecmo Super Bowl ruling the roost on the NES, and Mario having the top two slots on the Game Boy with Super Mario Land 1 and 2. In the Now Playing column, we have the Super Nintendo version of the Hunt for Red October shoot 'em up, and a NES port of Ultima 5. Finally, in Pack Watch, we have a bunch of really good titles here, including two based on FASA properties, Mech Warrior and Shadowrun. The NES version of Alien 3 is also previewed. For my pick of the issue, I'm going with Barman 2 for the NES, with Cybernator as a close second. Both games are very well done, and I look forward to playing both of them all the way... Let me do this. <coughs> <clears throat> for my pick of the issue, I'm going with Barman 2 for the NES, with Cybernator for the Super Nintendo as a close second. Both games are very well done, and I look forward to playing both of them all the way through at some point in the future. But I'd say Bomberman 2 is overall a better title. And while it doesn't have the full four-player multiplayer, which the franchise would become known for, still having the three-player is a nice option. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time. <laughs>